Um, I'd like to thank you all for being here. My name is John Todd. I'm the executive director of Quad9. Um, and uh, this morning, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the Quad9 open free uh, DNS recursive resolver with some security benefits. First off, I'd like to apologize a little bit. Uh, I'm in a hotel room and apparently five minutes ago they decided to do construction above me. So if there's background noise, um, I'll try to I'll try to speak clearly in, in my microphone and I apologize for the, the interference. Um, secondly, uh, we have an online question and answer section in the in the meeting. If you have questions throughout the, uh, the the call or the webinar, feel free to put them into the question section. We'll try to get to those at the end of the call. I'll read them out and uh, and try to go into each of them individually um, as we have time. Um, so let's get started. Um, so uh, I've said that uh, Quad Nine is an open, free. A DNS recursive resolver with security. So I think the first thing to do is to kind of give a very brief overview of what is the DNS. Um, I know that most of you know this already, so it'll be a fairly short uh, example, but uh, there are some folks out there who aren't quite certain about how the DNS works in their environment. Uh, DNS is the domain name system. Uh, this is the way that um, uh, host names or humanly memorable information like www.quad9.net is translated into other records. Uh, those might be IP addresses uh, or other names or uh, certain service types like mail records, et cetera. Um, and this is a fairly large system consisting of uh, authoritative and recursive resolvers. And I'll give you a description of each of those here in just a moment. Quad9 is a recursive resolver uh, that answers questions uh, for end users. Uh, DNS is not only used to locate these mappings, but it's also used to kind of validate them and ensure in certain circumstances that the answers are correct. Um, this is called DNSSEC, and we'll go into that also a little bit here in, in more detail as, how, as far as how Quad9 implements the DNSSEC protocols to ensure that you've got the correct answers for DNS questions. Um, DNS has been around for 40 plus years now, and uh, it's really the first step in any host, or almost any host or service, when it needs to connect or talk to some other remote system on the internet. DNS is the first thing that happens after a person enters a host name, there's a DNS lookup, or after a, a program is launched, it looks in a configuration file. And almost always there's a host name in there or a host record that has to be looked up in order for that process to continue. Um, so what happens after that first step is the end device, the client device, whether that's a, a desktop, a handheld, or an IoT device, talks to a recursive resolver. Um, uh, oh, sorry about that if my screen fl flickered. Uh, a recursive resolver is what Quad9 is. And a recursive resolver is one half of the DNS system. Um, your computers and any other device that needs to do a host lookup first will go and talk to a recursive resolver that tries to do, do a lookup on that DNS host name on the behalf of the end user. So recursive resolvers are they're dumb. They don't have they don't have any data themselves about host names until someone asks them about it. So uh, your recursive resolver that's, that you're probably using now is either located in your office or it's supplied by the ISP that you use. You ask it or your client or your devices ask it questions about host names and they in turn on your behalf will ask authoritative servers about those host names to get the final answer. Um, so uh, to give you a very quick summary on that, um, there's a whole set or a tree of uh, of processes that occur that the res recursive resolver undertakes for you, where if it doesn't know the answer, uh, which it, when you first run it or you first do a query to it, it doesn't know the answer. It first will ask, as an example, using www.quad9.net, it will see, look in its memory and say, hey, do I know the answer for www.quad9.net? Has anyone asked me about this recently? If the answer is no, then they'll go, all right, do I know anything about quad9.net, which is the next part of the domain name. If the answer again is no, they'll say, well, okay, do I know anything about net? And again, if the answer is no, the recursive resolver will say, well, I need to go all the way down to what are called the roots and say, well, who, who can answer questions about .net? Um, uh, and uh, once they determine who can answer questions about .net, that's a set of 13 root resolvers called the root authoritative resolvers. They'll go and ask one of those 13 resolvers at more or less at random or based on speed. Um, who can answer questions about .NET? They'll get an answer back. Um, these are the name servers that can answer for .NET. Um, 
they'll go to the, one of those name servers. There again, the answer is thir there are 13 of those name servers in the reply. Um, your recursive resolver will ask one of those 13, all right, who can answer questions about quad9.net and get a set of answers back. For quad9.net, I happen to know that there are three name servers that will answer for quad9.net. And then finally, your recursive resolver will go and ask one of those three IP addresses. All right, what is, what is the answer for www.quad9.net? So as you can see, this process takes a long time. There are a lot of steps in it. The recursive resolver, again, is acting on your behalf, asking all these questions. You never see any of that. That's kind of invisibly done in the background. Um, recursive resolvers are typically run by uh, the ISP or the enterprise, the edge of the enterprise network. Um, meaning that they operate those services for you, um, and those are configured, uh, or the, your your client, your 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 desktop, or your IoT device, or your handheld, typically knows about what the recursive resolver is because it's handed back as part of the DHCP response. So, how does Quad Nine fit fit into that? Um, Quad Nine is a a recursive resolver that can be either a replacement for or used in conjunction with your existing recursive resolver system. It has a couple of extra features though and, and a couple of extra policy um, concepts which make it a better choice in most cases. The first is that we provide an additional layer of security uh, on top of just the normal DNS answers. We have a built-in block list which contains a list of malicious hosts. And we'll go into where that comes from and what's in it in a couple more slides but we provide a basic level of security that is layered inside the DNS so that if you make queries to our recursive resolver, um, we will try to protect you and not answer questions if you're trying to go to hosts that are uh, intending to do you harm. Um, secondly, we have a high performance, low latency design. We're using a, a system that's worldwide and the chances are very good that Quad9 has a server that is very close to you, meaning it has a very good response speed uh, and it also has a, a lot of these answers already in memory because, of course, the more users on the system, the, more, the, the higher the likelihood is that an answer that you're asking about has already been asked by someone in the near history. So we'll have that in our cache already. The third thing that we really try to promote is that um, we are uh, a, a very private system, meaning that we, we are honoring privacy guidelines that are set up. Um, most notably, uh, the GDPR, which is coming into effect in Europe shortly. Uh, we believe that we are compliant with the GDPR. We're not reselling your data or rebroadcasting it or reusing it really for any other purpose other than the security features. This can't be said for some of the other um, uh, recursive resolvers or um, even for our ISPs who sometimes monetize that data, selling demographics. We'll get more into that in a little bit as well. Uh, Quad9 has any cast redundancy, meaning that our reliability is extremely high because even if one city is taken out of the, the mesh for maintenance uh, or for an outage, uh, another one will automatically be, uh, you'll be redirected to another one without any reconfiguration or usually any, uh, any notice on your side. Uh, the DNS will just continue to work. Um, again, Quad9 is a standard DNS compliant or RFC compliant. Uh, service, so it works with any of the devices that you already have on your network. And then lastly, and, and probably more, most importantly to some people, is that uh, this is a not, uh, this is a free service, um, and we are sponsored by several large organizations to promote uh, better internet security. And so there is no process that you need to go through in order to start using Quad9 or testing with it. Uh, in fact, there's, there's really, we have no way of even creating an account um, because of the privacy requirements that we have on the system. So it is a friction-free model for you to start using immediately. Uh, so I said free, and one of the things that uh, I always say is, well, if, if you're using the internet and the service is free, then you are the, you are the product, um, unless otherwise noted. And so uh, I wanted to kind of outline a little bit about Quad9 as an organization here to give you some comfort that, in fact, uh, you are not the product and that we are, in fact, doing this for the betterment of cybersecurity. So Quad9 uh, is an open and free DNS recursive resolver, um, and we are doing that based on grants from a variety of different organizations. We are organized as a 501c3 nonprofit here in the United States, uh, which means that we are not allowed to make or, or create a, a profit margin on our services, which is very different than pretty much any of the other 
models out there or even ISPs who have an incentive uh, to monetize user data. Um, that is not our model. Uh, and we will, and we are transparent about both our policy and our funding sources uh, to prove that that's the case. Uh, really, all we do is DNS. Um, we have an exclusive uh, focus on DNS. We're not a marketing company. We are not an ISP. Uh, the only thing we provide is DNS. So that is something that both, in, uh, I think, uh, validates the model that we're not reselling, but also um, uh, ensures that we're, we know what we're doing with DNS. This is the only thing we do. Our, our primary focus is on security, performance, and privacy of DNS. Um, we have 19 different threat intelligence providers supplying us with some of this information. Again, I'll go into this in a little bit more detail in a few slides. Um, the uh, easily memorable quad nine number, which is the IP address in IPv4 space that we use for configuration, um, allows you to, without too much lookup, putting that into any of your configurations without having to memorize um, uh, or, or even look up the service as far as how to configure. Quad nine was formed, uh, I guess we're going on two years now, uh, by uh, three, or three of our founding members, um, uh, IBM, uh, it, Global Cyber Alliance, and Packet Clearinghouse. Global Cyber Alliance uh, is a not-for-profit based out of New York City, whose charter is broadly to improve cybersecurity for as many people as possible, for as low a cost as possible. Um, they, are, uh, they are the initiators of the concept of Quad9 and uh, are still heavily supporting us in uh, in the Quad9 project for uh, exclusively for the cybersecurity component. Packet Clearinghouse um, has been around for about 25 years, also a not-for-profit based in Berkeley. Uh, Packet Clearinghouse operates a worldwide network of around 100 and, 100 and I think 85 locations now are inner exchanges at this point where they offer authoritative DNS service. PCH is, uh, has a couple of different charters. Um, the one that people most know about though is their authoritative DNS. So Packet Clearinghouse operates the DNS for uh, one, more than 110 nations at this point. So nations layer domains you may have seen like .in for India or .ca for Canada. Um, those are being rebroadcast from Packet Clearinghouse systems. Um, also two of the 13 root name servers that I briefly discussed um, have some of their infrastructure on the Packet Clearinghouse network. So um, PCH is, has been integral to us um, from a, an experience and network perspective. That's how we get this broad footprint that I'll describe a little bit later on. IBM is one of our primary threat intelligence partners um, and also uh, has been a, a, a big help to us in um, promoting cybersecurity as part of their initiatives in that space. So that's the IBM X-Force division. Um, so these three partners formed about two years ago and uh, created the Quad9 entity for providing DNS security. Um, so why use Quad9? Um, the, the primary reason that people are using Quad9 right now is the, is the one that's easiest to talk about, and that's the blocking malicious connections. This block list we have from a variety of threat intelligence providers uh, is, the, is the item that people most are most memorably able to articulate, especially in an enterprise space because it's a no-cost way of adding an, an additional layer onto existing security models um, uh, where you can protect yourself against cyber threats. Um, however, um, in some places, the other components of what Quad9 does are just as interesting. Um, the user privacy is a significant one where Quad9 is offering this service and we are not collecting private data. So that is a significant use point um, uh, for many organizations and that they understand that we are not remarketing, remonetizing, or repackaging their data, their private data out to third parties. Um, preventing injection spoofing uh, and man in the middle attacks. This basically says that Quad9 implements some components of both encryption and validation um, that prevent uh, third parties externally on the internet, meaning outside the control of both Quad9 and the client. Uh, prevent people from injecting bad data into the data stream. Uh, again, ensuring that uh, the site that you're going to is in fact the site that you intended to go to. Um, one of the things that um, 
talking about that injection spoofing or, or uh, uh, the security components of it, um, IoT protection is one that has kept coming up in other conversations we've had. So I've created another slide here just about uh, Internet of Things protection. Um, there are a variety of tools that you can implement on a desktop or even on a mobile device that try to reduce the threat uh, profile of that device by implementing an antivirus package or some other tool that, uh, that decreases your risk. IoT devices really don't have that. They're kind of black boxes. The only interface that most IoT devices have is that they do actually do DNS lookups. Um, so by implementing Quad9, you get some basic protection against IoT risks, uh, whether they be command and control systems or even uh, front-end uh, attacks against IoT where host names are looked up. This is pretty significant because uh, most, uh, again, most IoT devices have no uh, interface that you can talk to directly for that kind of threat mitigation. DNS is your only way to do it. We have feeds specifically designed for command and control and botnet filtering, often again, towards this IoT protection. Um, so that's something that uh, I know a lot of people are becoming more concerned about as IoT devices start appearing inside both educational or all, including educational enterprise as well as home networks, where those kind of IoT devices are outside of the control normally that you can apply with an antivirus or other kind of firewall protection. So let's talk a little bit about that block list or the set of block lists. Um, right now, we compile 19 different threat intelligence providers, again, including IBM, who's one of our primary sponsors, but um, various different classifications, uh, DGA or dynamically generated uh, domain, sorry, domain, gener <laughs> domain generation algorithm uh, hosts, which are more or less random uh, botnet uh, command and control systems. We have malware lists protecting you against standard uh, virus distribution or threat uh, uh, sites that are that are distributing malware, phishing lists. These are uh, typographically similar or um, uh, or falsifying uh, domain names that are inside of phishing emails. I was just looking at one this morning, which was uh, which was brought up as an example, which was Microsoft's updated.net. I think um, very difficult to see unless you're looking really at the at the close part, parts of the domain name now. So we get lists of those, insert them into our, um, into our feed, along with command and control, exfiltration destinations. Exfiltration is an interesting one where people are embedding actual data into the DNS, uh, where they're actually encrypting information into the DNS lookups. Uh, we do protect against those to some degree. Uh, and then also things like unexpected usage, um, uh, sites that are doing cryptocurrency mining with uh, web plugins, et cetera, that are that are, it's difficult to classify them as malware, but they're certainly unexpected. Um, what, do the, what do the threat intelligence providers get back from us? In other words, why are they contributing this data? Um, they do get something useful back, and that is that we give information back to them about the events that occur on domains that they give us. This allows them to strengthen their threat intelligence feeds. Um, they can watch, as an example, as a threat starts in uh, one part of the world and watch as it spreads to others. They can see what threats are no longer uh, as significant. Um, this is data that they couldn't ordinarily get uh, through any other mechanism. So they are very interested in some of the heuristics that we're able to give back to them, but those are purely based on how do we make this threat feed stronger? Uh, it's kind of a, a, a loop that we've built with the threat intelligence providers to improve the system. Um, so who should not use Quad9? Um, I guess the, the, long, the short answer here is I don't see who wouldn't, um, but we certainly see some interest from enterprise because again, the no cost, no friction model of sign up is something that's easy to, to understand. Um, ISPs, actually we're very interested in bringing more ISPs into the, into the model. And in, in fact, we even have a, a, an offering if anyone's interested where we can deploy a Quad9 server into the ISP network for even faster results. While we have uh, these 114 locations worldwide, which gives us great coverage, some ISPs want to have it, you know, they want to shave those one or two milliseconds off and have systems much more close to their end users, and we can provide that. Uh, educational is also an area that's quite interesting. Um, educational networks very often are bring your own device, and there is no, uh, there is no a significant firewalling that you can do because of all the services on top of those networks that are unpredictable. However, they all use DNS. And so if you can provide Quad9 as a DNS solution inside of an educational system, 
um, you know you're blocking things that are malicious. Uh, and people can, of course, still opt out by changing their DNS server to something else if, in fact, someone actually desperately needs to go to that malicious site for whatever reason. Um, don't know what that would be, but it does happen sometimes in research conditions. Um, integration, how do you do this? How do you integrate it? Uh, or maybe you already have an existing uh, a recursive caching resolver at the edge of your network. Um, so there's two ways of doing it. You can either change each device with a DHCP uh, result pointing to the quad nine address, and that's the standalone model. Or if you already have a forwarder in your network, you can just change the forwarding IP address on your external uh, gateway to point to the quad nine system. So we're compatible with all the Microsoft products, open source, as well as any hardware or other standards-based DNS system, uh, usually have the ability to point to a forwarder externally. So you can experiment with this at the edge of your network, again, with only one configuration point to change. Uh, currently, Quad9 does some encryption uh, models. We have DNS over TLS, which is an emerging model for encrypting the queries between the client and the server. Um, we've got some other uh, models coming soon, DNS over HTTPS. These are still fairly experimental, but uh, anything to improve the privacy and security of the DNS is something we're interested in doing. We do strict validation on DNSSEC, meaning that if your domain is enabled with DNSSEC, if, you're, if your domain name at your organization or the remote uh, domain name that you're trying to reach is enabled with DNSSEC, we will validate that to ensure that the answer that we get is in fact the correct answer. If you own a domain name, we would encourage you to take a look at DNSSEC and enable that on your domain after some uh, careful consideration. Um, it is a tricky uh, protocol to enact, but what it does is it ensures that people who are looking up your hosts, in fact, get your hosts and are not maliciously redirected to some of the location. Uh, again, Quad9 servers are uh, very close to some of these authoritative servers that PCH operates. So again, uh, that decreases the number of places where, uh, where strange things can happen on the internet as far as inserting uh, or trying to rewrite data from a malicious actor. Our current status. Um, so uh, we are primarily located at inner exchange points. This is, these are the locations worldwide where ISPs and other large networks come together. Uh, our equipment is typically in those facilities in, in about 114 locations now. Our target is a, to be at 150 by the end of 2018 and we're, going, we're growing at about uh, two a week at this point. Uh, we have millions of ENDS users, although exactly how many millions, I can't tell you because that's, <laughs> that's a very difficult question to answer um, because uh, single IP addresses may mask large numbers of ENDS users and it's difficult to disambiguate uh, queries from each other. Again, we don't really care how many millions of ENDS users we have um, because, again, we have no accounts and we have no privacy. We're not monetizing anything based on the number of users. Um, our early growth rates of about 2% per day are slowing down finally, uh, which is good because um, that we'd run out of internet fairly soon if we kept at that rate. Um, uh, and it's still showing ex exceptionally good growth. Um, uh, the project launched in November of last year after about a one year uh, trial period, mostly with state and uh, national government organizations. Um, and uh, we see about 1.5 to 2 million blocked events per day. Again, that number is growing at around the same rate as our user base. Um, we tend to choose uh, quality over quantity for blocks. We're really making sure that the, the blocking data we give out is in fact valid, and we're trying to keep our false positive rates to an absolute minimum if zero is, is possible. Um, and we've had 100% reachability for our entire growth period. This is not unusual. Any cast um, provides reachability, even if one or more sites are down for maintenance or other, other reasons, uh, your traffic would get rerouted to different places. Here's the map uh, right now of where we are uh, across the world. Um, we're at 114 locations, 73 nations, and six continents. Um, and uh, this, this site is expanding. The only places we don't have good coverage right now, uh, China, of course, is a, is a difficult place for us to get into. Brazil, we are working on expanding into Brazil soon. Um, and, but pretty much everywhere else uh, has very good latency and, and uh, good connectivity to our network. Uh, what is Quad9 not? This is one of the last slides before I'll open things up for questions. We're not a complete security solution. Uh, we are only a part of a layered security model. However, we're much better than nothing. Um, and most people right now, um, as, as, it, as crazy as it sounds, they have nothing. So Quad9 allows them to get some protection uh, where they might have had nothing. 
And if they do have protection already through some other package that's closely embedded into the system, it gives them an additional layer that's dynamically updated that they don't even have to think about. Um, so that's a, that's a pretty compelling reason as number one, uh, even though it's not what we do, we're not a complete solution. We don't do content policing, um, adult sites or gambling and other things, that puts us in some very difficult positions of having to determine what is uh, in what content. And that's not really what we're doing. We're a cybersecurity solution and not a content management system. Um, we don't have a customizable filter. Uh, there's really two flavors we have, which is on and off. You can either use Quad 9's blocking capabilities at 9.9.9.9, or you can use our unblocked feed, which is at 9.9.9.10. That has no filters of any kind and can be used for testing. Uh, and in fact, some end users prefer that because they have, they have security systems further down inside of their stack, uh, but yet they would like to get the performance boost of using a large recursive resolver. So we do have 9.9.9.9 and 9.9.9.10. Um, we don't provide reporting, meaning that we can't tell you how many blocks you get. At least we can't tell you that. Maybe you can build a tool in yourself if you have an edge system that provides that. But we don't store information about end users. We discard information immediately upon receipt. So we don't have a report of individual IP addresses. So we can't report that out and, uh, to the end user. Um, as it makes things much more complicated from a privacy perspective. Um, and lastly, we're not an antivirus system. Quad9 only stops connections to hosts, meaning certain domains. We can't prevent uh, uh, connections to legitimate domains that have, have compromised information on them. Again, that goes back to our first concept of not being a complete security solution. We are only a partial security solution, what should be a much deeper model inside of an organization. Um, so to recap, um, we are, uh, Quad9 provides kind of a universal solution for security using the DNS. Um, we provide the DNSSEC validation for zones that support it. Uh, we provide fast turnaround for DNS lookups with 114 locations and growing. Um, we have uh, excellent privacy models and uh, we are, uh, as an organization, designed to enforce those privacy models regardless of uh, any market forces, which might change the opinion of other uh, uh, providers of recursive solutions. Um, we have 19 different block lists. Um, instead of just one, we have 19, which gives us a much better footprint and a much bigger risk uh, profile pool against which we protect customers or from <laughs> uh, that we can protect customers from. So, uh, which is very different than certainly a single point, even as an example, an antivirus program, you might only have one of those. Um, we can provide 19 additional layers in the DNS. Um, simplicity, uh, all you have to do is configure 9.9.9.9 into your uh, DNS configuration, and that gets you onto the system uh, with just one change. And then uh, we're free. Um, there is no communication you have to have with us or conversation you need to have or contract you need to sign. Um, just put it into the system and you're good to go. Um, so that is the summary uh, I've got, and I'm gonna start to, I guess, open up uh, some questions here, if I can get this window a little bit larger. Uh, one of the questions is, can you have this slide deck? Yes, we can make the slide deck available. Um, we'll send it out to, uh, I guess, the participants on this list whose email addresses we have. We'll put it up on the website. Um, some of the other questions here. Um, there's a question about IBM Alliance and the use of Watson. Um, so at the moment, uh, we have some high level reporting that we'll, we'll be serving out on our website about how the blocks are working and where they're working. We don't have, a, as again, because we've still been, our launch is only what seems like 10 years ago, but it's only been six months. Um, we'll be putting up some of the metrics and information about our blocking uh, at a high level onto the website shortly, which I think will give some of the stats I think this question is, is regarding, um, but that's coming soon. There's a lot more reporting that we need to publish. Um, we've been really focused right now on the operational side of the array. Um, CDN support. So CDN support, I think you're referring to eDNS client subnet, also known as uh, ECS. Um, this is a, it's a feature or a bug, depending on who you talk to, uh, that recursive resolvers have. 
So some CDNs or content distribution networks require, or, or at least they are better served if the DNS requests that they receive from recursive resolvers contain the IP address or a portion of the IP address of the original client. This allows the CDN then in turn to try to find the best origin server to deliver the content to the end user. The quad nine system right now on, this, on the main IP address 9.9.9.9 does not include any ECS information in the DNS requests we make. We had long conversations about that and the answer was that we, tr we thought that ECS is a security leak, um, meaning that it is, I think most clients don't understand that, the IP, that their IP address or some portion of it is being relayed by the recursive DNS server to the authoritative. So on the recursive, the primary recursive that we have, we don't send ECS data, which means that some CDNs have to use the origin of the, um, the location in which we have our, our recursive resolver to try to guess how to deliver the content. We do have a model where we are uh, gonna be rebuilding um, a service on 9.9.9.11, .9 .9 <laughs> um, which will provide ECS as part of the query but of course, that's going to be for people who know what they're doing. They're actually going to have to go in and configure that. And then they have to understand, and they will understand by the, the nature of them using the IP address, that they'll be providing ECS data along with their outbound queries. Um, this is pending. Uh, the question was, when will CDN support be available? Um, we were hoping actually to have that released by now. Um, but uh, we actually took the opportunity to redo that as part of a, a larger telemetry rebuild. So I can't give you a date, but we're hoping to have it um, the, the intent is to have it by the end of April, um, but I have no firm date on that. And, and depending on how large or how many more changes we need to make to the telemetry system, um, that may push the date as well. Uh, question is, is there a secondary address in addition to 9.9.9.9? There is actually, um, we actually have another address, um, 149.112.112.112 that we provide as a secondary. However, um, 9.9.9.9, since it's anycast, um, is going to be probably sufficient for any system um, that is going to be um, uh, making requests. So um, uh, you can put the 149, 112, 112, 112 address in as a secondary if you need it. Those are answered um, by a set of servers which are almost identical to the quad nine systems. Um, that will give you uh, some redundancy, but um, in, in reality, the performance will be almost identical since you'll be getting to the same systems. We also have IPv6, which is there on the slide that's up on the screen, um, an IP, IPv6 address of 2620 colon FE colon colon FE. Um, that is, uh, again, the same systems as answering for quad nine. That is also in the block list. Um, Question is, uh, is there a splash page when, that loads when someone is blocked from a malicious request? Um, right now, we do not actually provide a splash page. Uh, we provide NX domain on the domains that are blocked. This might change though. Um, there, is a, there is quite a bit of discussion about how a splash page, meaning redirection rather than NX domain, might be beneficial as a thing to prevent confusion. Um, there are some, again, some privacy implications in that that we have to work out, um, but we are certainly looking at that and it's very possible that we may have a splash page for blocked domains here in the next few months. Um, okay, I think that that uh, kind of summarizes it up. Um, there's one last question here that's just RPZs question <laughs> mark. Uh, RPZs are response policy zones. Um, that's a DNS-based model that, that allows people to insert blacklists or block lists into the DNS. We don't use RPCs as they're defined uh, in, the, in the specifications. We have a different type of method that we use to distribute our block list data around to our, our resolvers. Um, and we also, unfortunately, we can't share that data. Our 19 different providers, um, uh, they give us that data on the understanding that we are using that for our end users and not reselling or redistributing it. Um, there are a lot of contractual issues there that um, they're giving us the data for free. Um, and we honor that by not distributing the RPZs as a, as a stream or as a published update. Um, but we do get that from a variety of different organizations, some of which are free, 
um, most of which are not um, freely available, I mean. Um, so I think that, that that kind of wraps it up. We're about five minutes past the hour. Um, uh, if there are any other questions, uh, I'm sure that we would have, be happy to take them to the support at quad9.net address. Also, you can email me directly. My address is there on the screen. I'll be happy to try to answer quick questions if I can. Um, again, we'll be making this available to you um, uh, as a download here in the next, uh, I guess, in the next day or two. Um, thank you, everybody, for attending. I appreciate your time and your, uh, your understanding of listening to the noise above me. Hopefully, that didn't interrupt too much. Um, and uh, I think that that wraps it for today.